Well, thank you for joining me for this first episode of She Thinks, a podcast where you're allowed to think for yourself. I'm your host, Beverly Hallberg, and I just want to let you know I'm delighted to be part of this podcast relaunch from the Independent Women's Forum. And I think it's fitting that our first guest for this first episode is Tammy Bruce. She's the president of the Independent Women's Voice, and she's a woman who definitely thinks for herself. But before I jump into that conversation, I wanted to just give you a little bit of background about this podcast, share with you why why I am here hosting it, and what I hope we can accomplish with it. Um, First of all, for those who are not consistent listeners, there are past episodes from IWF that you can access, so feel free to listen to past podcasts. Um, A little bit about Independent Women's Forum, though, for those of you who are listening for the first time, it is a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to advancing policies that help advance freedom, choices, and opportunities. And personally, it's been an organization that I've read from and attended events for for over a decade. So I've loved IWF for years, and they have this motto that I think fits really well, and that is all issues are women's issues, and that's one of the reasons why I've always been drawn to the organization. So when they came to me this past year and said that they wanted to be a fellow, I was thrilled, and then they asked me to be part of this podcast, and of course, I was honored to do that as well. But you may be wondering why am I hosting this, and and how do I want to take this podcast as we put out an episode each week is, well, I come from a perspective in communication. So I have a business called District Media Group, and the goal of the business is to help people be more effective in communication, specifically in media interviews. So I work with members of Congress and state legislators and academics and scholars and work with them to try to connect their policy message or their research to the average person. So one of the things I want to do with this podcast is hopefully put myself in your shoes, the listener's shoes, and ask the experts that we bring on, policy experts, to ask them questions to help us relate it to what's going on in our day-to-day lives. I know as a small business owner, things that I realized as I started a business were things like taxes and health care and fiscal issues became really important to me because as you run a business, of course, you have to face those things. So I want to think about what's going on in the news, what are the issues that we care about, and how can we bring on experts to really break it down for us and how it impacts our daily life. So this podcast will be, we'll, we'll have an episode every Friday, so you can expect a new guest to be on the show every Friday, hopefully talking about um, something going on in the news that relates to your life. And hopefully I'll be able to ask questions that can break through kind of the clutter and really the noise that we have on so many issues today. I think it's interesting you can turn on CNN and hear one topic from one narrative and then turn on a different channel and hear a different topic with a different narrative. And something that I've been hearing consistently from friends and colleagues is that it can be hard to know who to trust and really understand what's going on. So this podcast is to bring you all the facts all the information, make it relatable, and then it's up for you to think through what it means for you. So that's essentially the podcast. I want all of you to know that if you ever want us to focus on a specific topic, if you have questions you would like me to ask, feel free to let me know. Um, One of the things you can do is reach out to me on Twitter. I'm at Bev Hallberg, so that's B-E-V-H-A-L-L. B-E-R-G, and reach out to me and let me know what topics or what questions that you have. We'd be happy, and I would be happy, to be able to incorporate that into the podcast. So that's what we're about, but I don't want to waste any more time. I want to get to our first guest today, Tammy Bruce. You probably are familiar with her if you watch Fox News. She is a contributor on Fox News. She is an independent conservative. She's a political analyst. She's a New York Times bestselling author a radio talk show host, and she's a columnist at the Washington Times and foxnews.com. Tammy, it's a pleasure to have you on the first episode of the relaunch of She Think. Well, I'm uh, honored to be on, and when you you read my bio in that way, it, it exhausts me, so I'm glad I don't <laughs> think of it all at once. 
Yeah. Well, one of the, even in reading your bio, it doesn't even touch on some of the elements that I want, want to get to today, which is your background and how you ended up where you are today and, um, being an influencer for so many women out there and on many different issues. But I thought we would start with, for, for those who are new, newly subscribing to the independent women's forum podcast, of course, we re- rebranded it. She thinks I was hoping that you could share a little bit about independent women's voice. You're the president of the organization and just talk a little bit about what it is that you all do and what should people know about you? Well, um, I'm excited to be the president of Independent Women's Voice, and it was an interesting experience for me. I became president uh, last March uh, in 2018. Uh, Exactly 20 years after I'd resigned from being the president of the National Organization for Women in Los Angeles, Uh, obviously a left-wing organization uh, working on liberal causes, Uh, But I left because I'd realized that uh, the arguments that even then, of course, it was rather apparent, the arguments that the feminist left were making, that the left in general was making about the issues, uh, were effectively a fraud. Uh, And uh, my goal always has been, my politics really haven't changed. My politics are rooted in uh, the the notion of freedom is, is, is obviously what sets us free. Uh, that the economy is the thing that allows all of us, especially women and people on the fringes of society, people of color, uh, the marginalized uh, 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 women, individuals who've been either kept out of political power or uh, because of minority status have not been able to organize in a fashion to get them there, uh, that the thing that allows us to make choices that best suit us as individuals is having enough money to do so, is having a job that you can count on or having a, a, a being able to be free to start a business uh, so you can be independent, so that you can live where you want to live, that you can be in a relationship because you want to be, not because you have to be, that you're, you can have your kids go to the schools that you want them to go to. And all of these things can be achieved being in the middle class in this country. You don't need to be you know, a bazillionaire to, to have these things. These are very basic things we should be able to uh, expect. So in coming from the left, the argument always was that, you know, government and restrictions on people moving through from a victimhood framework was the thing that would uh, somehow set people free. Uh, And in fact, I've learned uh, over time and experience that it's the conservative ideal, uh, that small government, uh, a good economy, uh, the nature of things that allow us uh, to achieve what we can achieve, regardless, I mean, it certainly transcends partisan politics. This is the American right. ideal. Uh, it's the American exceptionalism. So in becoming president of Independent Women's Voice, uh, this is an organization that reflects those values. This is about women uh, and the nature of our lives, of which we share, regardless, again, of our politics or our ethnicity, sexual orientation, uh, the, you know, our race, uh, however it is we're choosing to live our lives. Uh, the, the real effort when it comes to advocacy for women comes down to making sure that uh, government is kept in check, uh, that the economy is good, uh, that we, we have the freedom to be able to live in a manner that suits us uh, at, with, without, um, uh, with, with less fear of violence, uh, with security in the country, and hopefully with a world that is as, as much at peace as we can make it. Uh, And Independent Women's Voice has a focus in that regard, Um, importantly nonpartisan, and at the same time, uh, really the only national women's organization that sees these issues within a a, a framework of uh, women's, I don't want to say women's rights, but certainly women's welfare, what what is best for women, because when women thrive, of course, communities do, families do, and the future becomes brighter as well. And I'm personally thankful for the work that you've done, what the organization has done. As a small business owner, I can say that even though I had a certain way of looking at the world, even growing up, and as I entered in my career, there was something about starting a business and seeing the day in and day out taxes and costs and regulations where you start realizing where you stand on certain issues. So I think it's amazing that just the evolution that you've had so much and how you view 
who handles these issues best? Is it government or is it an individual? Mm -hmm. I'm curious for you because many would listen to this and say, that's a big switch to go from running a chapter of now in Los Angeles to where you are today. Was there, was this a slow evolution in thinking about this or was there, can you pinpoint a certain time where you just knew, okay, that doesn't align with my values. What, what, what I was part of doesn't align. Yeah. You know, two things. One, I started doing a radio talk show in 1993, right in the middle of my tenure at now at a station called uh, KFI in Los Angeles. And I was told by my feminist sisters and uh, the liberal community to not do it because talk radio was evil. uh, And it was a station with Rush Limbaugh and that it was a trap and that conservatives were evil. And I, I took the job because I'm a curious person. And I found that in talking with effectively conservatives every day over the phone on radio, that they were not as they had been portrayed to me. And we still disagreed on many of the issues, or at least I I felt that we did. Uh, But there was a genuine um, curiosity on their part, a genuine willingness to talk about the issues. And that became an education for me on the issues. But secondarily was the Clinton-Monica Lewinsky situation which for me clearly was an abuse of power, uh, was clearly classic sexual harassment. The, 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 the power differential was remarkable. Um, and uh, I watched the Democrat women, uh, Hillary Clinton. I had worked on the Clinton campaign in 1992, and I watched them try to destroy that 20-year-old girl. I watched them come out onto the lawn of the White House talking about how great Bill Clinton was. We all watched him lie to us in various press conferences. And in the meantime, their focus was in trying to destroy that young woman's life and character in order to protect him. That was not feminism. That was not liberalism. It was not what we were told was happening. It's not who we were told they were. And it it occurred to me, and you don't need to be Einstein, that uh, people were being lied to. And certainly activists on the left, feminists had been lied to, that if we were really concerned and committed to improving the quality of women's lives, that even if this happened, because people make mistakes, people do, um, but even if this happened, the reaction uh, would have been inherently different if we weren't dealing with frauds. Ironically, of course, we've got a similar situation here now, right, with Joe Biden and the issue of sexual harassment. So... For me, that was a huge aha moment. Uh, and that is when um, uh, it, 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 it at least, I think, being on talk radio helped me and have conversations every day with people uh, to, ha- to understand the nature of what this was. And it helped me distance myself from the political aspect of this and re-embrace the issues and what needed to be done with the issues separate from party politics. And one of the things I find fascinating about talk radio, and first of all, um, you doing talk radio for so long, and it's hard to fill all that time. So I'm always impressed with people who have radio shows because it's a skill set and it does take a lot of work. Um, but I, I often tell people who I'm coaching to go do a radio interview that radio interviews are typically um, the hosts of the show tend to know a lot about the issues. And there's a reason why there are, are so many libertarian and conservative voices in talk radio. And I think the reason is, is when you do talk about the issues and you do get in depth and you do have mm-hmm. to wade through the pros and the cons of, of areas, you actually mm-hmm. tend to lean more conservative just because you know so much. Um, it's really getting into those issues that, that matter. And I'm curious to for you, as you went through this switch, what was the pushback like from your friends, maybe from family, obviously from colleagues? Was that a hard thing for you? Because I think there are times and as women, but just as people, we don't want people to be upset at us or to have to question us. How did you handle Mm -hmm. that period of making such a big switch? Well, you know, what's interesting is I think whenever as women, whenever we're uh, vocal and um, direct about things, it tends to rock the boat a little bit. Um, There haven't been a lot of women in talk radio, I argue in part because We do communicate differently. 85%, some studies have indicated 85% of our communication as women, as females, is nonverbal. And so our 
talk radio is a, is is a obviously a medium where we lose the visual mm-hmm. and the ability to convey uh, what you need to convey in a spectrum of emotions and and all of that minus the uh, physicality. Uh, you know, that seems to be to some degree more suited for what has been considered a male approach in communication. I contend that a great deal of that is training. That is women, because most people are larger than we are, and, and we tend to, you don't want to get into fights with creatures who are larger than you. We've tended to learn how to communicate in different kinds of ways that, that will be perhaps sometimes less provocative. Talk radio and certainly broadcasting, I think, in general, re- requires a, a, a direct way of communicating. And I think that's been a, a terrific education for women and girls. And it's not right for everyone. All of us communicate in different ways. But it's a very, very good lesson about the fact that women can do certain things that we were told only men can do right. uh, for a long time. Uh, women, you never saw women as television anchors for the news. And it was because their voices weren't deemed to be authoritative enough. Well, we broke that ceiling as well. So I think that it's a matter of um, making sure that we have models who are doing things. And, and when it comes to people being upset at transitions, you know, my work has always been based in kind of trying to move things along and changing a status quo. So I'm, I'm used to people kind of being upset a little bit. Uh, and over the years, and I think I've, I've gotten better at it, um, uh, is learning about communication and a, a real way to persuade and to convince people. And, and what you said earlier was absolutely right, is that for talk radio and for longer conversations, You must care about the details of the issues. Liberals, and from my experience, being right in the midst of of that pond, uh, don't have a grasp of the details, and they haven't uh, really worked on that skill because they've used emotion to move people. They've moved issues of fear and threat, and that's much easier, but you you begin to lose the ability to convince and to debate uh, and that's that's the mire that the left is in now. Uh, and this is why on the issue of convincing people and persuading and talking about the issues that we face, uh, this is why uh, uh, I think women indulging in this kind of communication is important. And it's why conservatives, uh, if they get out there and make the case for their issues, as we do uh, at Independent Women's Voice, uh, then we make a huge difference because it works. It does. And I think it's it's a combination of things. It's you're, you're talking about how liberals are very good at an emotional argument. I completely agree with you. I think often conservatives only make a technical response because their whole goal is if you just if I just educate you, then I'll change your mind. Mm-hmm. And that's not right. the case. Education does matter in explaining what's going on. But if you don't connect it to why people should care about it, then it's going to fall mm-hmm. flat because the emotional arguments are the ones when, when a person can see that how it's going to impact them and it seems that somebody cares about them, that's what people are drawn to. So I, I always admire people who can bring in the proof, the facts, but also be able to connect it to people and say, here's why it matters and I do care. I do care. Um, So I I think the art of storytelling is something that women tend to do better than men. And I think it's Mm -hmm. great when we have women out there who are conservatives, who are making or giving compelling arguments, especially, and I'm going to bring up a term you used earlier, with feminism, I think poorly defined these days or not accurately defined. So I'm curious from you, the term feminism meant something different years ago um, I think the term has been hijacked um, by by the left. They think it means one thing. I would say it means another. Where where are we with the term feminism and what most people think of it? And where should we should we be using it and trying to change the definition or uh, the fal- false mm-hmm. definition that people think it is? You know, it's interesting because obviously my my work in my adulthood was wrapped up with that term, and it, it's interesting. But what the left also does is that they. They, they have a, a bit of a vagary about terms, allowing their targets to then project onto them whatever it is they want to project onto them. But uh, recent polls, interestingly, show that the American people, women and men in all different parties from all different walks of life, don't like that term. 
maybe well, I think it was less than 15 percent wow. of 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 people or either identify as feminist or or think positively of that term. So the fact is that Americans have moved past that because of what they've seen now. And it's it's Americans. We love underdogs. We we are underdogs. You know, we're the youngest country, right? And we we right. we we are constantly striving to come to become better people and to become a better country. We like lifting up people. This country is made of people coming, leaving everything behind, and coming over and wanting more and 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 working for that uh, opportunity. Um, but what the left does is it it co-ops those issues. And in the case of women's advocacy, uh, it, uh, uh, it, it, all that was, by the way, it was a French term. Uh, it, it was co-opted from the, from the French framework, but all from the left. So it was, it was not about a real advocacy for women uh, across the board when it comes to the nature of women's lives. It was left-wing uh, politics wrapped up in, in that word and that narrative. And, and when, when that happens, then you're suddenly going to realize, as the American people did, that the so-called feminists weren't advocating for women. They were advocating for liberals. And that became apparent when, as an example, Kay Bailey Hutchison was running for Senate in Texas, and Gloria Steinem declared her, quote, not a real woman because of her politics. We, we still hear that today, that, that there is a demand to conform, and this is the other thing that it compelled me to leave the left. The, the irony of this claim that you're defending, you know, the people who are voiceless or who need defense um, so they could be free to be themselves. But then they were demanding a conformity uh, the, of, of, of politics and of thinking. We see that now at the academy. We still see it on the left. Uh, and, it, and, and that if you didn't conform, let's say if you were pro-life or if, if you were for a period of time, if you were gay, that was a, a big issue. Um, but if you, if you were a woman of faith, uh, that those were things that were really not acceptable. And, it's, and, and it moved along only through left-wing politics. And Americans, in their sense of fair play, recognize that. And we recognize that women uh, are different uh, in every single way. We have some commonalities in our lives. Uh, like thinking about the future and wanting the future to be better for our families and for our children or for our extended families and even for ourselves, that we, we want to have happy lives. Uh, that's a universal thing, obviously, for people, uh, but it certainly is universal for women. And that is not the, the liberal ideal. We, we see certain women being pushed aside or negated um, uh, by because they don't conform to uh, what uh, the left has determined as being the appropriate way of being. Uh, independent women's voice views uh, uh, operates on the opposite of that, uh, as did my activism. And that's why I'm so happy to be with IWV. My goal then as a feminist, and we, I think we should jettison that term because it is, it just is, it's not even functional at this point. But as an, as an advocate for women, as an American woman, uh, my goal is to make sure that every door is unlocked. Not that, that women have to go through, you know, one of three doors provided to them. But if there's 10 doors, I want all those doors to be unlocked and women to be able to go through which door suits them. So that whether it's to be a stay-at-home mom or to be a nun or to be a lawyer or to be a radio talk show host hmm. or to be a business owner or to be in the service industry, to be a traveler, who knows? Our lives are so expansive. We're still in the process of finding out what we want and the choices we want to make. Maybe we do want to stay home with the kids, right? Maybe we don't, maybe we don't want children and we want only a career. Maybe we won't want half and half. My goal, and I think the goal of real uh, advocates for women, is simply to make sure that when you wake up in the morning, you really do realize that it may be hard work, but one gr little girl is going to wake up and really have the chance to be the astronaut that she imagines she wants to be. Another little girl is going to wake up and, and wants to be the, the ballerina. Another little girl is going to wake up and want to be a police officer. And another little girl is going to wake up and can't wait to be a mom. What, some of those women will be all those things. All right? You'll be an astronaut and a mom and a cop and a mom. I want that 
to be our reality and to not have someone say that you've got to fit into this box in order to have representation in order for us to take you seriously. I want every woman everywhere, whether she be a woman of color in the inner city or, or a woman with a trust fund living somewhere in the suburbs to wake up and feel safer, to know that today is going to be a good day and that there's more opportunity for you and that we all, we realize we're in this together. Uh, and that is, it's, it's marvelously the conservative ideal. Uh, it, it's an effort uh, that our CEO, Heather Higgins, has worked on uh, most of her adult life as well, is making sure that doors are opened so that women can become uh, whatever we, we want to become when we, wake, when we wake up either, you know, as a little kid or uh, as we start each day uh, in our adulthood when we make our choices. And just kind of rounding that out a little bit, I'm curious from you what you think it does to women when they're told that they're victims. Now, don't get me wrong. I think there are a lot of things that women had to overcome in this country. I'm still not saying Mm -hmm. that sexism is completely gone. That's not the case. But I even find in my own work, one of the questions I get often is like, well, what is it like as a female business owner? They they tie this Mm -hmm female side to it. And Mm -hmm. yes, I'm feminine. I'm a female. Those things matter. But I was able to run my business regardless of if if I was a man or a woman. I was in a country Mm -hmm. that allowed me to open a business and we have good work ethic and we give a good service. And so I've wondered Mm -hmm. when women are told that they're victims, do you find that that has a lot of negative repercussions? And is there a possibility that women are realizing that that's, that's not who they are? They're not a victim and that we're seeing some pushback against the, the liberals who want to make women victims. Right. And, and that attitude from the liberal end of the spectrum is to manifest fear and the need for reliance. Uh, as self-reliance is the kryptonite to the left, the real, the individual woman realizing that, wait a minute, I can accomplish certain things, uh, that, that I don't need big government or, or, you know, a, a posse, if you will, to t- try to get me through each day in life. Now, that being said, uh, we do know women lead different lives. We right. do know that uh, the issues that we face remain uh, uh, violence against women, the issue of domestic violence, uh, discrimination exists, and not just for women, certainly, but people of color as well. These are challenges, and they're challenges we are well aware of and where advocacy matters. Uh, and is must be a part of the nature of, of the choices we make as advocates for women. But the difference is, is that we can recognize that, in fact, some women are victimized, but they right. do not become victims, right? They don't become victims. And it's a, it's a matter of we, we understand that the, that the uh, whether it's in business or even in issues of safety or in uh, the, the nature of jobs that are still available, uh, what, what the world expects from us, how can we compete? Um, uh, you know, are we being misled in the academy when we're getting degrees in women's studies and how is that really going to help mm-hmm. us in, in our lives? Um, all of those things. Uh, we have an economy where it's difficult for both parents to stay home when you've got kids. Now, wouldn't it, it would be fabulous to have an economy where a parent could stay home uh, with kids if, if they wanted to. These are things that we continue to have to work on. But for, for the left and for when women hear this, uh, the argument is in fact specifically meant to make you afraid, to make you feel as though you can't do something on your own, if you will, that the system is rigged against you. And so their advocacy is based in the negative. It's based in all right, there's going to be so many problems. You're going to need us because the world's out to get you. Uh, and we're going to save you from, and then the, the, this is the other horrible thing that they, they do because we do know there are problems, but then they cast their political opposition as people who want to continue the victimization. They then cast conservatives or Republicans, and I'm not a Republican, clearly I'm a conservative, but they cast, they use this as a political cudgel to convince their base, women, liberal women, that conservatives or Republicans or even men are, are, can't be trusted and that this is a, an existential fight. Uh, and it's as opposed to having two different ideas 
uh, that you know are both kind kind of looking at the future and how to make things better for people uh, you know that ended and the left in order to cast political opposition as the enemy you you've got to find an element that makes people afraid uh and uh it, it's it's a shame uh it's it certainly has harmed the quality of life for liberal women uh we see now with uh, the president trump's economic ideas how everyone is being lifted improving the lives of people across the board uh and uh, and yet just a few short years ago we were told the new normal was that everybody was going to be working two part-time jobs delivering pizza um so so uh, you know for american women uh it's it's not pretending that you know, our lives, because our lives are not like men's lives. You know, we do lead different lives. We have different concerns, different experiences with life. But I think that it's a matter of recognizing that um, uh, our lives are not based in victimhood, that, that we, we can work and succeed and excel, while also at the same time working to make sure that the issues that need to be addressed, like violence against women, domestic violence, um, uh, education concerns, uh, uh, are and the seriousness of 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 uh, how we're how we're dealt with in politics and the opportunities that are there. Um, uh, I think we can do both, and you can do it with strength and with confidence, uh, with mentors uh, and with role models, uh, and at the same time, uh, be honest about the nature of our lives. So final question for you to go uh, um, opposite than what liberals do, which is focus on the negative. I want to focus on the positive. Thinking about yeah. this upcoming year in 2019, what would you say is one of the positive policy changes that you think can happen this year that would benefit women? Well, you know, the president, as we, as I've mentioned a great deal about the issue of, uh, of, of safety uh, and uh, even school safety, one of the things that our nation is dealing with is the opioid crisis, right. uh, is uh, the concern that women have when they send their kids off to school and the drugs that are involved in our cities, uh, the, the nature of the quality of the, of the lives of, of our children, and if they're at risk every day, the number of overdoses with fentanyl and heroin is overwhelming, more than the combined uh, uh, death total of the entire war in Vietnam. Uh, and it's, it's frightening that as the president succeeds in, on, as an example, dealing with the opioid crisis and moving that out of, uh, out of our communities, uh, dealing with MS-13, which is a big propagator of uh, the distribution of drugs in the inner city and in our communities that affect women and their children, especially if you're a single mom and you go off to work and your kid's going off into that world. Getting get those gang members off the street is it, a remarkable achievement. They continue on that. This is why the, the border issue is important, because that also addresses the, the drugs that are coming into this country and the gang members, the sex trafficking, uh, et cetera. So the, when the president talks about and when we have a, have a government that would take seriously border security, dealing with gangs, especially tr a transnational gang like MS-13 uh, and um, uh, the, 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 the drug abuse in general, uh, we're going to be, uh, our families at least will be safer and our children will will be safer as well. There's that. And then there's uh, the administration's effort on uh, women in the workplace. Uh, certainly already, uh, as we have almost full employment, um, but it's still about good jobs uh, that are professional jobs that women can actually raise their family with or that a two-parent household maybe could start thinking about maybe one parent can stay home with the kids for a little bit of time. Um, things like that um, are underway. Uh, and uh, so it's at the core of the issue of the, the drugs and violence and uh, the safety of our children, in addition to the jobs that we get, uh, and making enough money as women and as parents or, or uh, uh, whatever our role in life is and our, future, our professional futures. So I think that is the president's current agenda continues. And if the obstruction uh, can end from both sides of the aisle when it comes to this kind of remarkable political change that President Trump recommends, uh, that this also is not about even a Republican agenda versus a Democratic one. It's an agenda for the American people, and it's one that women, regardless of their political position, can embrace uh, because we all win 
when these kinds of uh, agendas pass and get through. And just hearing about that, one of the things that stood out to me is you're absolutely right. These can be very easily bipartisan issues and people coming together yes. and working together on it. And and I know that's what you crave. That's what I crave is for us to stop all the fighting and actually figure out we have a lot of the same goals in mind, which is we want safety for our kids and for our families, and we want people to live prosperous lives. So thank you for the work that you've been doing to try to bring the message out to people. For those who do not follow Tammy on Twitter, you can follow her at eight, Hey Tammy Bruce. Um, so do follow her there. But Tammy, thank you so much for taking time with us today. Oh, great conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us. We hope you took away something new from today's conversation. And please, 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 if you enjoyed this episode of She Thinks or just like the podcast in general, we would love it if you would take a moment to leave us a rating or a review on iTunes. They do make a difference, so help out. Um, this is, helps ensure that our message reaches as many Americans as possible. So share the episode. Let your friends know where they can find more She Thinks episodes on their favorite podcast app. And from all of us here at the Independent Women's Forum. Thanks for listening. 